In this video, we're going to create a proof of the central limit theorem for the mean. This is only a proof for the mean. Uh, there are other central limit theorems that exist for uh, other things that look like means in some fancy ways, but this is just going to be a very simple case that we can prove uh, probably within the next you know, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, so we're going to start out with two quick notes that will help us uh, understand why the proof works. We'll start out with just a little page about moment generating functions being unique to each distribution. Then we will show you the unique moment generating function for the normal distribution with mean zero and variance equal to one. And then we'll uh, actually get to the proof of the central limit theorem via a Taylor series approximation. So if you don't recall from Calc 2 your Taylor series approximations, I encourage you to go do a quick look in your old textbook or um, just Google really quick what a Taylor series is, and it should help you get through this proof. So let's just jump to our first page and just say, Note, moment, oops, generating functions are one to one functions of random variables. which is to say moment generating functions are unique for unique distributions. So if you have a moment generating function of a particular functional form, and you know that that moment generating function's form is appropriate for a specific distribution, then you know you're actually looking at that specific distribution. So our proof for the central limit theorem is going to actually rely on this uniqueness of moment generating functions. So we're going to show that a um, random variables moment generating function the form of it matches the functional form of a normal distribution. Because it matches the functional form of a normal distribution's moment generating function, we will have justified that uh, our random variable follows a normal distribution, at least when our sample size goes off to infinity. So to help us see that, we will write down the moment generating function of the normal distribution with mean zero and variance equal to one has the following form. M of t equal to e to the t squared over two. So you'll know when our proof concludes by us replicating an expression for e to the power of t squared divided by two. And once we have found this expression, we know we're actually looking at the moment generating function of a normal distribution with a mean zero and a variance of one. So here goes our proof of the central limit theorem. Let's say you have capital N, so our sample size is capital N, random variables that are independent and identically distributed from some distribution F. We don't care what F is, so long as the mean is zero. And to be honest, that's fairly easy to uh, figure out how to do. You just kind of subtract off whatever the mean is from your random variables. You shift them appropriately. And variance, this one's a little bit harder to satisfy, but it actually turns out to be quite common in the applied world. 
a variance, which we will denote sigma squared, and it has to be finite. There are distributions with infinite variance, and in that case, this central limit theorem proof will not hold. But um, this is really quite a mild assumption. Okay, so that's our setup. So we're going to define the random variable Sn to be the sum of our observations. These are our capital N random variables. If that's the case, then the moment generating function of Sn, since Sn is a random variable, well, one touch up here, let's make this a capital N. Since capital S depends on random variables, capital S itself is a random variable. So capital S has a moment generating function. And we have already shown that the moment generating functions of sums of random variables turn out to be moment generating functions, uh, products of moment generating functions. So here with M and no subscript, I'm going to denote the moment generating function of each X random variable. Now, because they are identically distributed, the moment generating functions will be the same for each X1, X2, X3, all the way up to capital uh, X subscript capital N. So I'm just going to ditch the subscript here and M with no subscript will always refer to the unique moment generating functions for each of our data points. And I'm just going to multiply those together because we are interested in the moment generating function of the sum of random variables. Okay, so that part we have proved in a previous lecture. We're going to define one new term after we remind you about this. We're going to use that to define Zn, which is going to be Sn over sigma times the square root of n. And this is just a really obnoxious way to rewrite a form that we will see more often, which is involves a shifting and then a scaling, all kind of in one move. And the only reason we rewrite it from the more common form into this is to make the rest of the proof a little bit easier. So with that added notation, we can then define the moment generating function of uh, Zn, the random variable, because it depends on Sn, which itself depends on random variables. So Zn has a moment generating function because it is a random variable. And it depends on the moment generating function of the unique x's, where the argument looks like this. It's not hard to write out if you just write out the math to see why the argument changes by the part you scaled by and then the product of all of them, because Zn, in effect, is just a scaled sum. So the remainder of the proof then essentially takes this inside part, expands it into a Taylor series approximation, reminds ourselves, uh, then we will remind ourselves of the limit notation for um, e to the power of some stuff, and then the proof will be done. So we're going to proceed by expanding this inside part in a Taylor series approximation. So it looks like this. M of t over sigma times the square root of our sample size is approximately equal to our function evaluated at zero, so that is m evaluated at zero, plus the argument times the first derivative of m evaluated at zero, plus the argument 
squared times one half times the second derivative of the function itself, evaluated at zero, plus some terms that I'm going to claim go to zero as the sample size goes off to infinity. So this is just accounting for the rest of the infinite terms in this Taylor series approximation. But I'm going to claim that these terms all kind of go to zero as our sample size, capital N, goes off to infinity. So I'm largely going to be able to ignore this term here. Now, this right-hand side can be simplified. M of zero is really just one. If you do out the moment generating function evaluated at t equal to zero, this term is really just one. Now, if you recall from a previous lecture, the first derivative of the moment generating function actually recovers the mean, which we have assumed to be zero in this case. So this whole term just goes to zero since it's zero times something. So I'm just going to write in zero so you all see that this is taking that place. And this last term is going to come from an understanding of what this is. In general, the second derivative of the moment generating function evaluated at zero is just the second moment. But because we have assumed the mean to be zero, we could, but we won't, show that this is just equal to sigma squared. So we have sigma squared over 2 times t squared divided by sigma squared um, times n plus some extra leftover bits. Now some things here are going to cancel like this sigma squared in the numerator and sigma squared in the denominator. So we could write this out just as t squared over 2 times n plus this epsilon term with a subscript n on it because this term depends on the sample size n and remember it will go to zero. So all of this was just the stuff on the inside. So previously picking up where we left off we had this moment generating function now subbing in this bit we just um, solved for inside the power of capital N. So what we have to do at this point is recall the definition of e to the power of some stuff that looks like whatever your stuff is that might depend on n over n to the power of n. And this is e to the a n. So with that in mind, we can take the limit of this stuff and recover an expression of e to the power of some stuff. Now the stuff we're going to have is t squared over 2. So let's do one more slide where we write out the limit as our sample size goes to infinity of the moment generating function of zn is equal to 1 plus t squared over 2 times n plus some term that goes to 0, all to the power of n. And this is equal to e to the t squared over 2. Since e to the t squared over 2 is the moment generating function of a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance equal to 1, we then have proved that Zn equal to the sum of Xn, I'm just writing out Sn here, minus 0 over sigma divided by the square root of n is approximately normal. And this is what we will play with throughout the week, is essentially this proof that this expression 
is approximately normal dependent on the sample size. You can see this is an argument about the limit, and it only holds with equality in the limit. But outside of equality, we can get approximately normal. And that is what we will see um, in multiple ways this week.